Hello, everybody, and welcome to the SAGE's Safe Close Cystectomy, What Every Surgeon Needs to Know webinar. Um, I have the pleasure of being a co-moderator with uh, Dr. Michael Brunt. Um, Dr. Michael Brunt is a professor of surgery at Washington University. We have, in addition, our other faculty members, Dr. Denise G, who is an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, as well as Dana Tellum, who is an associate professor at the University of Michigan. So I will um, hand it over to Dr. Brunt, who really was the genesis for this Safe Close Cystectomy Task Force, and he's going to go over a little bit of the overview of how much of a problem that bile duct injury is and uh, where, where do we start to address it. Thanks, uh, thanks, Fernando, and uh, welcome, everyone, um, to this um, session on safe cholecystectomy. This is a topic that uh, I've been very passionate about for the last uh, many years, um, and so uh, we really appreciate you joining us in tonight to hear a little bit more about this. This is my disclosure slide, and the main disclosure, the only one that's relevant, is I chair the SAGE Safe Cholecystectomy Task Force. Um, so I thought, I, as the senior member of this group, I thought it would be good to go back in time a little bit and just to review a little bit of our history with cholecystectomy. When I was in surgical training, I didn't do a single laparoscopic case, and I finished just before the laparoscopic revolution started, so it was really a fascinating time. The first lap coli that was done was actually by a surgeon in Germany, Eric Muhe, uh, although more commonly, the first lap coli is attributed to Philippe Murray in France, who uh, did that in 1987, McKernan and Say in the U.S. in 1988. And then a really landmark event was when Jacques Perrossat from France presented a video of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy at the SAGES meeting. And there were a number of SAGES leaders who were there and uh, who really recognized this as revolutionary and uh, got SAGES very involved in the next steps in the development of this procedure in education and training. Now, as I mentioned, I didn't do any laparoscopy as a resident, and we had a, an entire generation of surgeons out there who didn't know how to do this new procedure, and a lot of it was very much driven uh, by the patients because the advantages were obvious to everyone. This is a slide that Nat Soper gave me, and this is uh, brochures for laparoscopic cholecystectomy courses that came across his desk in one single week back in the early 1990s. And so what would happen is these uh, two-day courses would be set up. You would go in, uh, listen to some lectures, go to the lab, do some laparoscopic skills, then hear some more talks and go back and do a couple of lap coles on pigs, and then go back home and start doing it on patients. And of course, uh, not surprisingly, there was a problem with that, and that is that there was an uptick in the number of bile duct injuries uh, that occurred. And there have been many papers that have been published on this over the last many years. So where are we today uh, with cholecystectomy? I mean, this is uh, one of the most common operations done worldwide. There are between 750,000 and a million of these done in the U.S. every year. Complications occur in 6 to 7% of patients. I have them listed here. Uh, some of these are very, potentially very serious, and of course, common bile duct injury is the most dreaded complication. And this impacts substantially healthcare resource utilization, ER visits, readmissions, and patient uh, quality of life. This is uh, a study that was published uh, nine years ago uh, looking at complications after cholecystectomy. And as you can see over time, things really haven't improved significantly. Some of the best data on the risk of bile duct injury is from the Swedish National Registry for Surgery, which was founded in 2005, and this is called GALRIX, and it captures about 90% of all cholecystectomies that are done in Sweden. And in their, their analysis of almost 50,000 patients, the incidence of biliary injury overall was 1.5%. That included bile leaks, but the number of patients who required major bile duct injury and reconstruction was 0.3%. While that may not sound like a very high figure, if you multiply it by the number of cholecystectomies done um, annually, it, it actually is a substantial number of patients. There's also survey data of practicing surgeons, and uh, there's been a recent study that's uh, confirmed this uh, as well. 
and this was uh, from the American College of Surgeons, and, and almost 38% reported being the primary surgeon for a bowel duct injury, and 13% had had more than one injury. Um, and uh, <coughs> so you understand a little bit why I am so passionate about this in the very early phases of my career in the early 1990s, I had a couple of patients with bowel duct injuries as well. And it really has a significant impact not only patient but also on you as a surgeon. These patients have numerous reinterventions and hospitalizations. They have early and late complications. There is substantial mortality uh, up to 20% or higher, and it's over 8.8% above what one would expect for that individual's age-adjusted rate of death. And there's also a significant economic health care impact from this. It's been estimated combined health care and uh, medical legal aspects is up to a billion dollars in associated health care costs uh, annually. It's also the most common reason for litigation against general surgeons. The, these are three different studies that are shown here. Uh, one from the 90s, one from the mid-2000s, and the one on the right more recently from the Canadian Medical Protection Association. So these are cases of litigation that involve lap coli. As you can see, by far and away, the most common reason for litigation was bile duct injury, anywhere from 53 to 78 percent, but there were also bowel injuries and vascular injuries as well, and these are major vascular injuries that occurred. And in a significant percentage of, the, of these, the injuries were missed, and the mortor, mortality rate was substantial. So uh, SAGES uh, started in 2014 a program uh, called safe cholecystectomy with the goal of reducing and preventing bile duct injuries. Uh, the mission uh, of this is to enhance a universal culture of safety for cholecystectomy to minimize the risk of bile duct injury. So we have a safe cholecystectomy task force. Uh, this is the URL for the link. If you uh, Google or search for safe cholecystectomy, the first thing that should come up is uh, the SAGES website on this that explains a little bit about the program. Now, one of the first things we did is we went through an expert Delphi consensus looking at critical factors for safe cholecystectomy in surgical practice. This was reviewed by 160 SAGES committee members and key domains were identified. And out of this arose what we call the six-step program for safe cholecystectomy, of things that you could do now. Um, and uh, for those of you who are in residency training and programs, I think it's really important to understand this and to make every effort to apply these. So we're going to touch on a number of these tonight, but basically these are the six, understand and apply the critical view of safety. There's evidence that that's not completely understood. Understand and recognize aberrant anatomy. Have an intraoperative timeout or pause before you clip or cut any ductal structures use cholangiography or other imaging modalities liberally, recognize the difficult gallbladder and how to manage it, and then finally get help for difficult cases. Now, um, another initiative that this group undertook is that we had a multi-society state-of-the-art consensus conference on prevention of bile duct injury during cholecystectomy that was held at the beginning of the American College of Surgeons meeting in Boston last October. Uh, Besides SAGES, the America's HPB Association, International HPB Association, SSAT, and the European Association of Endoscopic Surgery all participated in this. And this has gathered a lot of uh, momentum. The goals of this conference were to identify optimal strategies for bile duct injury prevention and to develop and disseminate evidence-based practice guidelines for safe cholecystectomy. And these are going to be forthcoming in a major publication in uh, the next uh, few months. Um, you may have also read about it in that uh, uh, General Surgery News uh, publication, which is probably the most widely read uh, uh, pub, uh, publication for uh, general surgeons. Or you can go to the website and, uh, uh, to preventbdi.org, and you can um, uh, learn more about the specific questions that we addressed and uh, recommendations that came forth from this. And then finally, uh, you saw on the login page uh, that we have put together these uh, series of 12 didactic modules, which we call the safe cholecystectomy modules. Um, and they are available on the SAGES website. They are free. All you have to do is create a user ID and login. 
they're on the same uh, location that the fundamentals of endoscopic surgery is right now, and uh, in the future they're going to be um, hosted on uh, an organization-wide learning system that SAGES has uh, developed. But this is also from the SAFE Cholecystectomy Task Force. So I hope you will take the opportunity to take a look at those, and a lot of what we're going to talk to you about is based on uh, um, the um, uh, uh, modules uh, that we have developed over the last uh, three or four years. So with that, um, I uh, will wrap up the introduction and uh, turn the next phase of the program over to, over to Dr. Denise G uh, from the Massachusetts General Hospital, and she's going to talk with you about preoperative evaluation and anatomic considerations. So I thought I would um, actually use some of these modules uh, that we've developed on the Safe Cholecystectomy Task Force to talk about two um, aspects that are very important uh, when proceeding with a laparoscopic cholecystectomy when a patient presents to you. And so the first half of my talk will be on the anatomy and um, critical variations in anatomy that uh, you should be aware of. And then the second half will be on specific preoperative considerations. So these are based off of the modules that everyone has access to. Uh, and we'll run through these uh, slides here together. So it's important to note that the typical anatomy is really present in only one half um, of people. So the typical anatomy that you learn of uh, where the right anterior um, sectional duct meets with the right posterior duct uh, and then joins with the um, and then joins with the left hepatic duct are um, much more rare than one would imagine uh, based on uh, textbook reading. And the cystic duct joins the common hepatic duct uh, about two centimeters below this confluence, although again, this is not always uh, what's commonly seen. So the most important anatomy um, to be aware of is this hepatocystic triangle. So this is the area, as you can see here, the triangle between um, the cystic uh, duct the cystic artery and the uh, lower border of the gallbladder. Um, and this is where um, the cystic artery runs through. And it's important to note that the cystic artery may or may not run through this triangle, uh, but the, the uh, typical uh, teaching is that it does. The hepatocystic triangle, depending on how you vary your retraction and your dissection, will change in shape. And as you can see in each of these pictures, the triangle actually does have a different formation, um, but the borders um, are always the same. And so some of the variations in right bile duct anatomy, um, as you can see here, are that the right anterior and posterior sectional ducts can join the common hepatic duct uh, differently. Uh, they don't always join first. And as you can see here are some of the variations that are commonly uh, seen. This is an intraoperative cholangiogram where the right anterior and posterior sectional ducts can be seen. And as you can see here, the distance between the cystic duct and the lowest right duct is actually variable. And you can see that right over here. When the right posterior duct is separate, uh, oftentimes this can be very risky in your dissection. In fact, as you can see here, as it's moving, the right posterior duct can insert anywhere along the common hepatic duct. And in this photo right here, if the right posterior duct joins with the cystic duct, if you divide right here, that can be a devastating complication. So this is something to look out for, and it's important to uh, divide the cystic duct very close to the gallbladder. And again, here's another example of how the typical teaching of a lateral entry of the cystic duct is actually only present in 17% of patients. Um, and in fact, it can enter the, um, the cystic duct can enter in various uh, different other locations, medial, posterior being most common, as well as parallel. And this, again, can be um, dangerous as well during your dissection. It's important to be aware of this uh, variation which we'll talk about in a little bit. So as you can see here, 
when the cystic duct runs um, parallel to the common hepatic duct, the dissection you have to be very careful uh, to minimize the risk of injury to the common hepatic duct. Other things that are important to be aware of with cystic duct anatomy is a short cystic duct, and this is often the result of fibrosis or severe inflammation. Uh, and sometimes what happens is you can develop um, the gallbladder comes very closely, as you can see in this lower photo, to the common bowel duct, so it's almost hard to visualize the cystic duct. And this is a, um, this is a critical uh, variation in anatomy that you need to be aware of. And if it's difficult to perform this dissection at times, uh, someone with hepatobiliary expertise may be required uh, to help in the operating room. Another uh, an anatomic variation that is important to be aware of is the subvesicle bile duct. And so often these can be confused uh, with the ducts of Lushka, but in fact they are different. So these are sectional ducts that are located under glycine's capsule, very close to the gallbladder, and is present in up to one-third of individuals. So oftentimes after the cholecystectomy, if there are leaks uh, postoperatively, it can often be from these subvesicle bile ducts uh, and are actually not um, ducts, of, ducts of Lushko leaks. So it's important when you're doing the dissection to try to stay outside of glycine's capsule uh, as much as possible to prevent this complication. Besides cystic duct or hepatic duct uh, anatomic variations, there are also variations in the cystic artery, which are important uh, to be aware of. So oftentimes we learn of the single artery um, that occurs in 75% of patients with both superior and inferior branches. Um, but other um, variations in anatomy are also important to note, for example, um, when um, it orig originates from the right hepatic artery, um, or um, when the right hepatic artery is posterior to the common hepatic duct. And so as you can see here, the artery is often um, found within the hepatocystic triangle, although less than half the time, uh, I'm sorry, over more than half the time, this can be find in, found in other locations as well. And here you can see the dorsal view of the hepatocystic triangle, and you can see both the superficial branch and the deep branch. And it's important to note the branches of the artery and also to try to dissect uh, and divide the artery as close to the gallbladder as possible so as not to injure other vital organs. Here's another uh, example of dual cystic arteries uh, from the right hepatic artery. And as you can see here, the right hepatic artery runs here with the cystic artery um, here, and then another artery a little bit further up the gallbladder, both which need to be divided separately, but this anatomy is um, critical to be aware of during the dissection. Here are some other variations of where the cystic artery uh, can um, come from, uh, and normally the right hepatic artery, um, but if it comes from the gastroduodenal artery um, or from the SMA, the um, risks can be great uh, with increased bleeding, um, and so it's important to uh, be aware of these variations. So again, the um, cystic artery should be divided at the wall of the gallbladder. Um, to avoid compromise the right hepatic, um, and also to preserve a hepatic artery or recurrent artery um, that can branch off the cystic. And that's, as you can see here, it's more important um, to make sure that your dissection is up close to the gallbladder. Um, other hepatic artery variations, the right hepatic artery is usually posterior to the common hepatic duct, but in some patients can be anterior. Um, 15 to 20 percent of patients, their right hepatic artery originates from the SMA. Um, and when present, this vessel can be found at the dorsolateral aspect of the hepatoduodenal uh, ligament. Uh, here's another image uh, of where the right hepatic artery can be closely applied to the gallbladder. 
um, for variable distance. And so again, it's important to be very careful with their dissection. And this is a dorsal view, um, but you can see a ventral view of this as well. And a similar photo uh, as seen earlier. There are four uh, orienting uh, landmarks that are important to note um, during cholecystectomy, and these um, are, will be described in these next four slides. The first is the falciform ligament. Um, so it's important to note that this is located between segments three and four. Um, if your dissection is near the plane of this ligament, then you're oftentimes too far to the left side of the patient. So it's often important to pull your camera back um, in order to get a broader view of your dissection. Rubier's sulcus um, can be either very obvious, as in the top photo, or a little bit less obvious um, in the bottom photo. Um, but this is a fissure uh, where the right portal pedicle enters the liver um, and can be seen with the gallbladder um, being retracted upwards. Uh, dissection needs to be anterior to the plane of the sulcus. The epicolidocal plexus um, is the, are the vessels um, that supply the common bile ducts and usually can be seen uh, between the, three, the typical 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock um, locations, and that can be seen uh, here, this plexus on the common bile duct. And this is how you might know that you're dissecting the common bile duct and not the cystic duct. Um, and then finally, the duodenum um, runs uh, here <clears throat> and you want to be um, far away from the duodenum. Uh, anything that's traveling behind the duodenum is the common bile duct and not the cystic duct. So at this point in time, we'll turn over to preoperative uh, pre considerations. So these are some of the um, things to think about, about uh, for a patient who's undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And so the key to this, similar to knowing the anatomic variations, is safety first and being prepared for the possibility of a difficult gallbladder. So this includes reviewing acute and chronic comorbid conditions, um, identifying any potential red flags during workup, and considering other factors such as obesity, prior abdominal surgery, or pregnancy. And the important thing to note is that it's just as important to know when to operate as to know when not to operate. So there are certainly some situations where non-operative management is more appropriate. So some of the conditions to consider include acute cholecystitis, and these patients generally prevent with, uh, present with acute right upper quadrant abdominal pain, with fever, a positive Murphy sign, um, and they may demonstrate on imaging a distended gallbladder with a thickened wall. Labs uh, demonstrate increased white blood cell count and possible increased uh, LFTs. And as you can see here, again, wall thickening and pericholecystic fluid on ultrasound, which is the gold standard uh, imaging technique. Risk factors for difficult cholecystectomy in patients with acute cholecystitis include over 72 hours of symptoms, an increased white count of greater than 18,000, if the gallbladder is palpable, in patients with increased age and comorbidities, and in patients with a suspe suspected gangrenous gallbladder. In patients who have presented with greater than 72 hours of symptoms, uh, many times non-operative management should be considered, and as you can see through the photo, uh, via interventional radiology, a catheter can be passed percutaneously to drain the gallbladder in order to cool it off. Maritzi syndrome is described as compression of the common hepatic duct by a large stone that's impacted in the gallbladder neck or the cystic duct. Uh, and sometimes a cholecystobiliary fistula can form, and as you can see in the photos, they are um, classified from type 1 to type 4. This requires increased clinical suspicion because oftentimes the symptoms mimic acute cholecystitis. 
Uh, fevers, chills, and other signs of infection are possible as well as jaundice. Uh, patients with myritis have an increased white count with abnormal LFTs, uh, and therefore important to have imaging, which include ultrasound, CT scan, or often uh, MRCP. And many times you can see a large stone uh, impacted in the gallbladder with a dilated common hepatic cell. Things to consider uh, for mercy syndrome are that these are very difficult uh, operations uh, with severe inflammation and difficult operative conditions likely. Therefore, uh, patobiliary expertise uh, is important and oftentimes these patients uh, may require, um, may need to be referred out uh, as needed. Um, CT scan can help rule out malignancy and cholangiography uh, such as uh, ER, via ERCP or MRCP may be helpful keeping in mind that ERCP can be both therapeutic and diagnostic. Patients who have uh, cirrhosis or portal hypertension often have evidence of disease on exam or imaging, and these can include uh, right over quadrant pain, bleeding or ascites, intermittent colic, or these patients can be asymptomatic as well. And so it's important to obtain uh, labs, which uh, include uh, liver function tests, uh, a COAG panel, um, as well as uh, other um, testing such as renal function testing, a viral hepatitis panel, or levels of hepatotoxic agents such as uh, acetaminophen if the patient is at risk of taking them. On imaging, uh, one can find on the ultrasound or CT scan Typical findings of cirrhosis or portal hypertension, including varices uh, or ascites. On MRCP, um, we can evaluate the biliary tree for stones or strictures or any other pathology. Uh, here is a uh, photo of dilated vasculature in a patient with portal hypertension. So we need to approach these patients with extra care. And again, another um, situation where hepatobiliary expertise may be required. It's important to note that acute hepatitis or cirrhosis can mimic signs of acute cholecystitis. Um, so it's important to rule those out. However, one must keep in mind that acute cholecystitis is also common in this population um, and therefore should be carefully evaluated. These operations may involve considerable risk and therefore determining the child class or MELD score preoperatively is important and be sure to optimize liver function, correct any coagulopathies, um, and consider expert consultation or transfer to a tertiary care center as, uh, as needed. In a patient with suspicion of malignancy, uh, it's important to note um, if they have unexplained uh, biliary obstruction, weight loss, or mass seen on imaging. Um, these patients um, may or may not have uh, polyps, uh, many patients do have polyps that are not actually malignant, and therefore patients with uh, polyps that are less than 10 millimeters can be followed with serial ultrasound examinations. Uh, however, if they're symptomatic, they have blood flow in the polyp, invasion of the liver bed, or porcelain gallbladder, uh, these may be situations where the uh, polyps do need to come out. And the, the uh, method of uh, doing that is to perform an entire cholecystectomy. It's important to note uh, on imaging, gallstones with or without dilated bile ducts, uh, solid mass, and or asymmetric wall thickening. And if the patient presents with jaundice, one needs to determine the cause of jaundice and make sure to rule out any malignancy with the imaging studies uh, described earlier. In some cases, in order to complete the workup for malignancy, the cholecystectomy may need to be delayed and in these cases, biliary decompression with an ERCP uh, or antibiotic therapy may be indicated. So I think uh, with the timing to stay on time, I'll stop here with the most common uh, things to consider and then pass this along to the next speaker. Okay, so next, uh, Dr. Dana Tellum is going to talk to us about safe access techniques, the standard dissection, and the critical view of safety and the straightforward gallbladder, how, how to really approach uh, routine cases. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present here today. And today we're going to talk a little bit about safe access, dissection, and getting that critical view of safety. 
So these are my disclosures. They shouldn't impact what I have to talk about today. So basically, when we talk about access, I think this is one of the most important things to consider when we're starting a cholecystectomy, because if you can't get in safely, pretty much the whole case gets off to a bad start, and the case is essentially done before you've even started. There's two main types of access we talk about, namely an open access or a SON approach or a varus needle, which is a closed access. There's also the OptiView approach, which can be done either with the varus needle or on its own. And to the right, you can see some of the different types of access trocars that there are from shielded pyramidal, from the shielded blade, and um, the varus and conical and the radial expanded. And it's important to understand what you have both at your setting and how each of these different trocars differ and the appropriate way to kind of put them in. And so when I'm thinking about how we can really do safe access for these and what considerations that I use, there's a couple things that I really think about that are important to keep in mind. First off is the body habitus of the patient. While there's no right or wrong way to do access as long as it's safe, I typically prefer to use a bear's periumbilically. That said, not everybody can do that. And when you have super morbidly obese patients or very thin patients, you could see how that could result in injury. And in those patients, I often prefer left upper quadrant um, access in the Palmer's point. Second is prior abdominal surgery. For patients who've had major abdominal surgeries before, you have to be very thoughtful about the, how you're going to go in. Some people may prefer a cut-down approach, others a varus, but you want to stay away from the area where the previous surgery has happened. And um, while you know, varus and Hassan are both equally um, valid ways of entry, you can note that the literature hasn't shown a difference in injury, but just perhaps easier recognition when you do have a Hassan or close it or open access technique. Also, you want to take a look at the abdominal wall. If you look here on this image on the right, you can get a fairly good idea of how the different vessels and vasculature run on the abdominal wall, which is important not just for access, but for consideration for where you place your trocars. You really want to avoid the inferior epigastric veins. As um, Dr. Brunt had presented earlier, there's about a 10% complication rate after these operations. And oftentimes, some of these complications can actually be abdominal wall hematomas from trocars that are placed through the epigastric vessels. It can create significant bleeds for the patients. I think in some instances, you also want to be mindful of true midline trocar placement. A lot of patients can often have diastases, and this can predispose them in the future to hernias. The second thing is, is if you've had somebody with prior abdominal wall surgery and you want to place a varus or somebody has had a history of a feeding tube on the left upper quadrant and when you want to use the right upper quadrant, you have to be cognizant that the liver is in this area also, and this also can increase your risk for embolism. And finally, at the end of the day, it all really comes down to comfort and preference in some ways. I think it's really good to have um, familiarity with many of these different techniques, but to get really good at one and feel very comfortable with that, however, be able to kind of switch if, if needed. So before we get started on this section, I want to talk about some key concepts to think about before we even move forward and talking about the actual dissection on the gallbladder. The first thing is you really want to think about orienting to the anatomic structures. And Dr. G did a really nice job explaining the anatomy and the different variations and what to keep in mind as we approach these operations. The second is that exposure is really critical. Uh, Dr. G also showed you how the hepatocystic triangle can look differently with different types of exposures, how you use that left hand, how your um, assistant is retracting for you can be the difference between a very safe versus a very unsafe operation, even the most routine gallbladder. Secondly, staying on the gallbladder wall. And this is particularly important as you come off the back of the gallbladder and taking that gallbladder off the liver bed. Oftentimes, people may be using the back end of that hook to bovi straight and bovi up. And what you don't recognize is that there can be a shallow middle hepatic vein. And if you get into that, that can cause a tremendous amount of bleeding and morbidity for the patient. So you really want to make sure, particularly in those dense intrahepatic gallbladders, or even in just the regular common gallbladder, that you're very mindful about where you are in that dissection. Finally, is a critical view of safety, and we'll talk about that in a second. Liberal use of intraoperative imaging, which we're going to hear a little bit about in one of the subsequent talks, and bail-out techniques, really knowing when to say when, and we'll be discussing that in the upcoming talks as well. And so finally, when we're thinking about key concepts in terms of what to think about when you're approaching a gallbladder, I think about these in two, two sort of domains. One is your dissection or the technique that you're going to use, and the second is the identification of your anatomy. There's three different types of dissection techniques I think many people discuss 
One is the infundibular technique. The second is the top-down or the fundus first or the dome-down approach, which is often referred to. And the third is really a semi-top-down where the gallbladder is dissected sort of in the mid-portion of the gallbladder and then well, work downward. And then identification of anatomy, we really talk about the critical view of safety and intraoperative imaging. So let's touch on that critical role of exposure first. This um, image came from a paper, I believe, Nat Soper had uh, written, or John Hunter, I'm sorry, back in 1991. And it really talks about how to maximize your exposure to get the safest operation you can by pulling and extending out a hepatocystic triangle, where your first grasper, which is, has the red arrow there, lifts the fundus cephalid really towards the right shoulder, which reduces the redundancy in the infundibulum and helps to expose that cystic duct. And your second grasper retracts laterally. I always tell my residents either laterally to the side or really try to aim for that um, right lower leg to make the cystic duct perpendicular to the common bile duct. That way, if you have some of that aberrant anatomy, you're stretching it out as much as you can instead of having it lay in parallel to the duct, which can lead to a critical injury. So when we talk about the infundibular technique as we move forward, this is really a neck up approach. And essentially what you're doing, and people have kind of different ways of doing this, is really retracting that gallbladder, exposing this area, opening up that lateral sidewall of peritoneum, and gently dissecting out the structures. While I think this is the most common technique that people use, there are certainly issues that can arise from this technique, namely when um, you have a dense inflammation or things get pulled into here, you can have very easy to misidentify various structures. And here, this is from a paper from Steve Strausberg from 2008, which talks about infundibular error traps and what happens with this type of dissection, is that when you have severe inflammation that's really obliterating that triangle of glow, the common hepatic duct can appear to be part of the gallbladder wall. And you can see you can easily circulate the common duct or even up to the common hepatic duct and take that out. The other thing that can happen in here is that um, if you do have dense inflammation and you're dissecting in here, and you do have either vet, sometimes the vessels uh, really adherent to this infundibular area, as you're doing that posterior dissection, you can get into very dense vasoturin and cause a significant amount of bleeding. So really have to be cognizant with this, even for, for especially for um, difficult gallbladders. And another technique that people discuss a lot is the dome down or the fundus first approach. And so some of the advantages of this is that you're going really from known to unknown, and you can reestablish an anatomic orientation sometimes. Um, a lot of times this is how we used to do this traditionally with open procedures where we would work our way down and then be able to pull off the gallbladder to expose the critical structures. However, it's really not foolproof. And the issue becomes is because we don't do it this much this way, it can be a very unfamiliar technique that you're going to employ in the most difficult cases. The dissection heads towards critical structures, and you can see um, there's been certain case reports as you kind of go down the back of the gallbladder, if there's dense inflammation and you don't realize that the structure is where you are, you get a little bit lost, you can actually go into the portal venous system and create massive exsanguinations and deaths have been reported this way. And also, you can contain the dissection to the inner layer of the subserosa to really avoid these vascular biliary injuries. And here are some images just of that top-down technique. You can see the gallbladder being retracted laterally and electrosurgical hook using that to bring that down as they approach the critical structures. Um, really, when you get into challenges here is uh, some people really like to employ this middle first or a semi-top-down approach, which might be more amenable to grasping and retracted, and you can work downwards towards the cystic plate if that's amenable. And also, getting the liver up in these very dense uh, cases, people with very heavy livers, if you want to do this using blunt graspers to distribute the tension, a rolled up gauze like you'll see in the image in the right lower quadrant, um, right lower aspect, I'm sorry, right lower part of the slide, and or you might even consider using a liver retractor in these cases. There are error traps with this, and again, I, this is something that I discussed before, but it's really associated with some vascular injuries. And interestingly, it typically occurs after open conversion. So oftentimes, because these are deployed in the most difficult cases and we're using this technique we may not be as familiar with, um, there are higher likelihood for open conversion. And it's interesting because the literature so, shows that an open conversion is an independent risk factor for a bile duct injury, which is probably is a surrogate marker for just difficulty of the case and non-familiarity of the territory and uh, dense inflammation. 
And finally, there's a semi-fundus down approach, and I, and I will employ this sometimes. And essentially what you do here is get behind that gallbladder on the cystic plate and then bring it down towards the critical structures. This gives you the benefit of kind of keeping part of that dome of the gallbladder attached so that it's not flopping down in the field while clearing the cystic plate so that you can imagine that um, you are getting uh, above some of the structures that are heading back to the liver. Again, this can be fraught with danger in areas of dense inflammation where you're not quite sure where those main structures could be and you could easily uh, get into any one of those. And finally, as Dr. G had talked about earlier, really the goal of these operations, no matter how you do it, is to attain the critical view of safety. And essentially what the critical view of safety is clearance of the hepatocystic triangle. But most importantly, and I think the thing that is often missed, is clearance of the cystic plate. Because a lot of the things I talked about were the potential for missed vascular injuries during to um, misidentification and dense adhesions. And if you've really cleared the cystic plate and can confirm that there's nothing else going back into the liver, then the likelihood that your two structures that you see right here are what you expect them to be is, is very much likely. So with that, I just want to say thank you. And um, if anybody has questions, please feel free to add them on the chat. Thanks very much, uh, Dana, for that uh, excellent uh, review uh, on the safe dissection uh, techniques. And we can certainly come back to some of this uh, a little bit later. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Fernando Santos uh, from Dartmouth. And he's going to talk on the role of imaging and approach to the difficult gallbladder. Thank you very much. So we'll first talk about intraoperative glandiogram. Uh, this was first pioneered in 1937 by Dr. Uh, Marisi in Argentina. And this was basically done uh, at a time when a lot of uh, common bioduct explorations were done empirically. And this helped avoid unnecessary common bioduct uh, explorations. It also helped identify and reduce the incidence of ductal injuries. And as you can see here, uh, IOC really allows you to identify the anatomy of the biliary tree that's particular to the patient you're operating on. And it also allows you to discover um, more frequently bioduct injuries intraoperatively before you leave the operating room. As you saw in one of the previous slides, the um, the problem for getting uh, sued is not just having a bile duct injury, but actually more often is missing the bile duct injury that gets you in trouble. So IOC really allows you to confirm that you've done what you think you've done. So what we are looking for is essentially where the cystic duct uh, enters. You're going to want to look at the distal common bile duct. You're going to want to look at the intrahepatic both the right anterior and right posterior sectional ducts, as well as the left hepatic duct. You want to look for filling of the duodenum, which indicates um, that contrast is emptying from the common bile duct. And you're going to want to look for any filling defects that would indicate common bile duct stones, which can cause trouble after the operation. So the indications for IOC, there are several um, things such as dilated common bile duct on ultrasound, history of pancreatitis, um, jaundice, elevated liver enzymes, and difficult cholecystectomies if you need to identify the anatomy. Um, one way to easily remember all the indications is to do routine IOC, which is what I do. That way, I don't really have to remember the indications. So the technique for intraoperative cholangiography really starts once you've obtained the critical view of safety. Um, you can perform cholangiography as an alternative uh, identification strategy, but it's really recommended, uh, I think, in most safe if you can obtain the critical view of safety first. So what you do is you place a clip on the face, on the specimen side of the uh, cystic duct. You're going to make a small transverse ductotomy. You don't want to dissect um, all the way across the duct and divide it. This can make it very difficult, if not impossible, to do the cholangiogram. And what the surgeon's um, hand is going to do is actually align that duct in a favorable configuration with the scissors so that you can then make the cut where you want it and place your catheter. And I actually prefer to make the cut with my left hand as this is the direction that my cholangiogram catheter is going to be coming in. 
This is a video showing you how it's performed. In this case, the um, right hand or the subxiphoid port is, is being used. I prefer the uh, left hand um, coming from the lateral direction. That actually uh, does allow you to have the clamp away from the uh, biliary tree. Otherwise, you do run the risk of steering small stones. So once you've made the dichotomy, you really only need a little bit of catheter sticking out of the clamp. And once you are in the duct, you can secure the catheter using the clamp. You can flush to make sure that there's no leakage. If there is leakage, you can readjust and then uh, bring your C-arm in and do the calendrium. So this, this technique with the Olsen clamp really changed the way that I saw calendrography as a third-year resident. And from then on, using this clamp was really much easier than trying to do it by clipping uh, the catheter. So as we discussed, one of the benefits is recognition of injury. This clangiogram shows um, stravization from the common bile duct. And so this patient was um, repaired intraoperatively. This is the other um, common air trap. So one thing about cholangiography is that the act of actually just squirting dye and putting a catheter in the bile duct doesn't actually really do anything. What, what actually matters is how you interpret the images. And so I think this is one of the reasons why personally uh, performing routine IOC, doing all of these uh, cases with cholangiogram really uh, elevates your level of interpretation. This has been shown that surgeons that don't do routine IOC actually are not as good for interpreting clendrium. So this is a classic uh, example where, for example, you do an IOC, you see distal filling, and you really don't see anything else. Some people frequently fail to recognize that there's filling of the proximal biliary tree. And in this case, you can see that there is an occlusion. And so this is not a clendrogram that you want to miss and just walk away from and finish the operation. You want to really investigate this and make sure there's not an injury here. This is another uh, example. As you can see, uh, one of my favorite um, signs of lap coli's gone bad is you can see about nine clips up in the um, dissection area. This is usually a tip off, as you'll see later, that something is wrong. In this case, um, with the recognition that there was no proximal filling, one of the clips was removed and it actually was um, actually not a division injury. So this was found with clangiography. One of my topics that is dear to my heart is um, bile duct stones and the management of those. So as you can see here, IOC really is um, one of the best ways to detect these. I, in, in terms of comparison with MRCP, it's um, it's cheaper. You can actually see smaller stones more uh, frequently. You have a chance to intervene on them. And as you can see here, these stones typically could, will show up in a number of ways, either as filling defects there. You can also see more subtle signs, such as the meniscus sign, which you'll see later if we have time. Or you may just not see uh, duodenal emptying. And so th that should be a tip off as well. Um, if you find stones, you really should have a plan for dealing with them. And this will depend on your resources at your hospital. You don't want to just uh, ignore these because they can lead to bio leaks, readmissions, and pain. And so uh, whether that plan is post-op BRCP or common bile duct expiration will depend on your resources. This is an alternative uh, imaging technique for clangiography. So if you can't um, find or you're not sure where the cystic duct is or wh which one it might be, you can actually insert um, a needle into the gallbladder squirt some dye. I haven't found this to be um, extremely helpful. I've done tried this in a few cases. However, it is an option that's described uh, and can help you in some difficult cases. So what about, um, what, what does the literature say on IOC and the incidence of bile duct injury? There's really controversy on this subject, and this is not just in the laparoscopic era. This has been since the open era. However, there are very large database studies, over a million cholecystectomies, and showing that with IOC, there was a 
lower associated uh, injury uh, risk compared to without IOC. Now, there's a lot of limitations to some of this administrative and retrospective uh, literature, and that is we don't always know exactly why the cholangiograms were performed. Was it because this was a routine for the surgeon and they were um, not expecting trouble and they ended up finding trouble? Or, for example, was this somebody that uh, didn't do uh, cholangiography routinely, but then they had a difficult case, an injury perhaps, and then they did a cholangiogram? So if, if that's the case, then cholangiography is associated with, with higher injuries. So you can quickly see where the confusion can be with some of these retrospective studies. Some of the best uh, data is actually from Galrix, and there are studies from Galrix showing that just the intention of do, wanting to do IOC um, at the start of the operation. So if you set out wanting to do IOC at the start of the operation, it can reduce your risk of injury. And I think I'm not exactly sure why this is, but perhaps uh, those surgeons that are doing IOC pay a little closer attention to that section, more aware of the potential for injuries, perhaps that's why it's happening. It does seem to be most effective in certain subgroups, so patients with chronic cholecystitis and a history of prior acute cholecystitis. It does not seem to really make a difference in straightforward, routine, um, uninflamed gallbladders. And I think intuitively this makes sense. These are typically easier cases compared to those really tough ones where IOC can really make a difference and it can help you identify injuries um, more easily. So we will move on. So the other technique that we'll talk about is laparoscopic ultrasound. This is uh, done using a laparoscopic probe inserted typically through a 10 millimeter trocar. And this is um, something that not uh, a lot of surgeons do, but those that do find it extremely useful. It can give you some real time um, Imaging data does not require a C-arm, so you can also repeat this test during the various phases of dissection. So if you are facile with it, it can be very helpful. And in terms of the comparison to IOC, I think this is a, essentially a complementary technology. So the effectiveness for detecting stones is very similar. The um, disadvantage is that you, you you, um, you don't get a roadmap the same way that you would with the image of a cholangiogram. So that's one of the downsides. Um, however, um, it is a nice technique if you can uh, learn it. And some surgeons actually to uh, learn this will, will do both ultrasound and cholangiography during their first 50 cases, for example, and learn this technique so they can correlate both findings. So. There is literature showing that it does decrease um, injuries and may help with the dissection and reducing the uh, risk to conversion to open. So again, this is a, a helpful technique if, if you have the expertise. One of the newer techniques that is on the horizon um, and available clinically, uh, several companies make near-infrared fluorescent cholangiography. The idea is you inject an endocyanine green dye intravenously prior to the operation and then use a special camera to be able to detect the presence of that dye, which is taken up by the liver and excreted in the bile ducts. So this may allow you to intraoperatively in real time using a flip of a camera or some other in imaging systems with integrated views, actually see where the bile ducts are. Some of the limitations of this uh, that still need to be worked out are Obesity and acute cholecystitis may make imaging of these structures more difficult. As you can imagine, the tissue is thicker, and so the, the fluorescent light is unable to sometimes penetrate those. The other major limitation of this technology currently is that you really cannot visualize bile duct stones. So if you're looking for bile duct stones, which for many people uh, is the main reason for IOC, you really need to rely on IOC or ultrasound because this will not show it. These are some images showing that um, it does become concentrated in the liver and then excreted. You can see the, the bile ducts here. There are some systems that can remove some of the background um, fluorescence from the liver. As you can see here, this is a, a hybrid image uh, showing that. 
And Dr. Brunt, I believe, will have some video showing some of this uh, in real time as well. Okay, so we're going to move on for the sake of time. So we'll talk a little bit about the difficult gallbladder. So some of these conditions uh, were previously mentioned, so obesity, severe chronic cholecystitis, which leads to acute fibrosis or chronic fibrosis that can be like chiseling cement, as well as acute cholecystitis, Maritzi syndrome, and cirrhosis. So severe obesity can be quite challenging. Exposure typically needs to be um, performed with additional instruments. I typically like to place an additional right lower quadrant trocar. Access is also important. If you place typically uh, umbilical trocars, this will tend to um, be too low in the obese patients. And so one of the other challenges is the obese patients tend to have really a lot of fatty infiltration in the liver. This can make it very difficult to even see the gallbladder. The gallbladder becomes intrahepatic. And just being able to lift the gallbladder can be very challenging in these patients. So what we've done for uh, some of our patients, I actually do this for patients with a BMI above 30, um, is to put them on a two-week preoperative low-calorie diet. And this reduces the uh, bulk of that fatty liver and really makes a big difference in terms of your intraoperative difficulty. You typically want to tell patients only to do this for two weeks. Otherwise, uh, they'll start to cheat because this is a tough diet to stick to. and it's important that they stick to it the last two weeks. So as we talked about, there's various options for access. Typically, I find a varus needle or optical entry easier on these patients. And you can see this is quite far from this patient's umbilicus. And what you can do is a typical landmark, which is usually pretty consistent, is the xiphoid. So you can use a hand's breadth um, from the xiphoid to your trocar of 15 centimeters, um, depending on your hand size. So retraction is the other challenge, and this is often because these patients have a lot of um, visceral fat, and the liver can be very large. So this is a video showing that you sometimes can benefit from placing a, a, an additional trocar in the right lower quadrant and using a liver retraction in this case to improve your uh, view. You can also just use a, a grasper to push down uh, gently. And this will usually allow you to see the gallbladder neck. So I have a low threshold for, for doing that. Next condition is chronic cholecystitis. It can, this can make things really difficult and rock hard and make um, this, those structures in the passage triangle fused and can be dangerous. So these are some of the risk factors that were mentioned for chronic cholecystitis, typically um, that you can see here. So the operative strategies, we've already covered a little bit. We want to make sure that you have good retraction, uh, cephalad and lateral uh, with your retractors. And you want to be aware of that fusion that will sometimes obliterate the space between the gallbladder and the common hepatic duct. You want to use liberal imaging for these patients as well. So we'll move on for the sake of time. So in terms of the timing of the operation, ideally, if you can uh, reach these patients within 72 hours, this can be a, an easier operation. Um, although it is um, bloody and edematous, you can reach these patients usually early. The tissues are still soft, and you can still work and obtain a critical view of safety. The difficulty is when you have a patient who's waited lo too long, and this is when the fibrosis starts kicking in, and it can be difficult to obtain the critical view of safety in these patients. So as was mentioned, percutaneous cholecystostomy should be um, considered in some of these patients, especially if they are critically ill or if you don't have the expertise to approach these difficult cases. Um, this is a picture showing what's called a mental pack, which is essentially where the omentum is walled off the gallbladder. And this is one of the signs that you're going to have a difficult cholecystectomy. The other thing that can be challenging is even grasping the gallbladder for retraction. So, Using an aspiration needle 
can decompress the gallbladder and make it easier to grab. I like to use a lot of uh, blunt uh, dissection of these patients, either with a Kittner as shown there or with a suction irrigator. And I find this sometimes to be more effective, a little more gentle, and uh, certainly with a spreading technique or with electric surgery sometimes. So this is a nice uh, adjunct. So the other thing that you may find is very large stones in the gallbladder, which make it very difficult to uh, grasp. So you may need to actually open the jaws of your instrument, push the gallbladder from side to side. That may be the only way you can have to manipulate these gallbladders. The other uh, operative adjustment to consider is use of the harmonic scalpel, especially on the liver bed. I find a little bit um, caution in using this for the dissection of the pedicytic triangle. I think that because it is an energy device, sometimes people can be tempted to take too big of structures. And I find that the hook I, I still use sometimes because um, I think you can see a little better and it doesn't make you as, as brave. And a picture of a mental pack. So other um, signs that this is going to be a dangerous gallbladder include air in the wall. Um, and this is Maritzi syndrome, which was mentioned. This will create a lot of fusion between the biliary tree and the gallbladder. So this is not something that you should approach uh, lightly if you don't have the proper uh, experience. Cirrhosis and portal hypertension is the other important consideration. These, these cases can be um, pretty dangerous pretty quick. And so make sure to choose your cases based on the Childs and MELD uh, score. Childs A and B patients can typically be approached laparoscopically. Childs C patients really should be done at a, um, a liver center because these patients can uh, not just have significant major bleeding, but they can really decompensate from hepatic failure just from general anesthesia. So you should be prepared for that. Um, these patients can have recanalized umbilical veins, which in some cases can be uh, quite dangerous. As you can see here, if you were to inflate that with a varus needle or do a cut down on this, you could really uh, quickly be in a, in a bloodbath situation. So for these patients, typically make sure you use extra trocars for exposure if you need to. Sometimes you can use a liver retractor as well. Um, the harmonic scalpel is really helpful for these patients for minimizing bleeding and hemostatic agents. The other consideration which we we'll talk about is uh, have a lower threshold for subtotal cholecystectomy in these patients. Imaging can be uh, also important. Sometimes it's more challenging to get the critical view of safety because the liver is stiff and the gallbladder is limited in its mobility. So this is a, a nice adjunct that can help you. Okay, so we'll move on a little bit if we have time to we have about five minutes. We'll go through the judgment section, which I think goes along with difficult gallbladder. So um, you should be familiar that um, with the concept of stopping rules, these are actually used in aviation and nuclear uh, power plant uh, management. And these are essentially rules that are designed to prevent pilots or nuclear reactors from operating in zones of increased danger. So for example, you might say um, if you're a pilot, you're not allowed to fly you know, below 5,000 feet. And if you do, uh, go below 5,000 feet, the, the visibility is bad. And so you need to uh, quickly come up to uh, higher altitude or go to an alternate airport. And so these are mandatory actions that try to steer you back to safe operating conditions. So it, you can imagine it can be a little difficult to directly apply this to cholecystectomy, but you might think of a rule, for example, that if you can't achieve the critical view of safety within a reasonable time or despite using different strategies, then you should switch to an exit strategy. Pausing rules are similar. They should prompt a pause. 
for example, one uh, rule that you can apply is if you see a, a clip on a duct that you thought was a cystic duct and it's, it's too big for the clip. So this, this should make you wonder, is this really the cystic duct that I'm looking at? And this is one of the reasons why I always um, worry a little bit when I see uh, folks using vascular, uh, vascular staplers on the biliary tree because I think while it's a nice device, um, it can um, make you wonder whether you actually are dividing something that's too big that probably you might not be wanting to divide. Other pausing rules are if you're dissecting and all of a sudden you have bile in the field, you need to really figure out where that's coming from. Is it from a missed uh, electrosurgery injury? Is it from a traction injury? Um, the other things are, for example, like in that previous cholangiogram, if you see nine clips in the field, you should really be asking yourself what's going on. Maybe I need to stop and, and think about what's going on. If something on the anatomy or the IC is unclear, really just stop and ask yourself, do I still think that what's the proper anatomy is actually the case? So naturally this leads to the subject of calling for help. So I think from a surgical culture standpoint, we need to stop thinking of calling for help as a sign of weakness. Calling for help is actually a sign of good judgment. And especially when you're early in your experience, uh, calling one of your senior partners in for a second uh, opinion, just another set of eyes I think can be very helpful. You may need them uh, to scrub in uh, if you need a high level skill. Or if a major complication has occurred, call somebody in. This is not a time where you want to be beating yourself up and making then a second bad decision because you're still uh, very emotional about the fact that you had an injury. So what about converting to open? So a lot of people talk about this very reflexively. Oh, we can't get the critical view. We, you know, we're having trouble. Let's convert to open. So the problem is, is that nowadays we don't do a lot of these cases in training, and these can be extremely challenging cases nowadays. These are not the bread and butter open cholecystectomies of the past, which were pretty straightforward. So if you're somebody with limited laparoscopic experience, it might be helpful before you convert to open, call one of these um, partners that has laparoscopic experience, and you may find that you may not need to convert. Um, if you have a lot of laparoscopic experience but you're not comfortable doing open cholecystectomy, get help from somebody who does before you convert. If it's not available, then you need to ask yourself, Okay. Would I be better off just doing a laparoscopic exit strategy? So when should we not convert to open? So one of the reasons um, I think that we're all uh, becoming more aware of, if you suspect that you've caused a bile duct injury, don't open. This is oftentimes um, a problem because people do more dissection, they make it worse, now you've created a bigger problem that somebody else has to fix. So if you suspect that the bile duct injury, just leave a drain and get out. And Dr. Brunt uh, will cover some of this in his module. So the other thing that you should not open is if there are signs that you really cannot proceed with a safer section open. If the tissue is fused, if it's like cement and you're, you're, you can't even chisel through it, Opening is not going to help you because this is going to be just continuing a dangerous dissection. Think about an exit strategy in this case. So this is an example of a Maritzi's case, and you can see just by the fact that we have a liver retractor, this was a very difficult case. So when, when, you, when you're in a situation like this, really, you know, think about how, how can I get out? These are the options. So subtotal cholecystectomy has uh, really changed the landscape, I think, for many surgeons. Um, it is feasible either laparoscopic or open. There's a low risk of stone recurrence if you do it the right way, which we'll show you. There is a risk of bio leak, which is the most common complication. Thankfully, most of the time, these will heal uh, as long as you leave a drain. And the risk of bio leak injury is extremely low as long as you don't venture into portal, portal structures. So this is the... Um, the correct and the wrong way to do it. So on the left, you can see what's called the reconstituting subtotal cholecystectomy. And really, subtotal is the preferred nomenclature instead of partial. What you can see here is the 
surgeons created a, a miniature gallbladder by oversawing the lower portion. This, these will typically recreate stones and become symptomatic. So this is the wrong thing. Rather, what you want to do is you want to create an open uh, front aspect of the gallbladder. You can typically find the cystic duct orifice from the inside. If you can place stitches to close this off, great. If not, just leave a drain and get out. So this is a video showing uh, an example. So in this case, there was a lot of fibrosis. We could not get the critical view of safety, so we opened the gallbladder midway up using the electrosurgery hook. Mnemonic is also a nice uh, option here. Once we have the gallbladder open, can, you can get a grasper, get all those stones out, get yourself a laparoscopic specimen bag. I, I like to put one of these into the abdomen and just have there so we can part the stones. You're typically going to be taking chunks of the gallbladder off as well, so those can go in the bag. Once you've gotten the, the walls off, then you can more easily see where the stick duct is. Oftentimes it'll be um, visible, and you can see bile coming out in some cases. So you're going to trim the lateral sides. The harmonic uh, is typically very nice for doing this. Be careful on the medial side. Typically, you'll, you'll run into the cystic artery branch, and you may need a stitch in, in that side. What you want to do is don't, go, don't get too aggressive here. Leave some of that back wall on the, on the cystic plate. Last thing you want to do here is go too deep, get too aggressive, and cause an injury. So this is just about getting as much of it out, but uh, within reason. If you have the cystic duct orifice visible, now you can actually do a cholangiogram. You can pass a catheter. As you see here, you can use a balloon catheter sometimes as well. If you can place a stitch to close that cystic duct from the inside, great. What you want to try not to do is to over sew the lumen uh, of the gallbladder itself and essentially make a miniature gallbladder again. So you just want to ligate this. Uh, duct, but you don't want to create a mini gallbladder. Next, you want to, if you can, use electrosurgery to ablate the mucosa to minimize the risk of a mucosal. And you want to leave a drain. Tube cholecystostomy is the other technique, which I think we're going to uh, run short on time, so we'll skip, but you can find this all on the uh, modules. Okay, so we'll move on now to Dr. Brunt's talk on complications and management. So, um, thanks. Uh, I, so, I'm going to, um, actually, there are a number of questions. I thought maybe we should uh, pause for just a bit and uh, address a couple of the questions and also make a, make a couple of comments. So, if the, all of the panelists could uh, unmute so they can speak or unmute when you're ready to speak. But um, at first, just to uh, comment about uh, clangiography a little bit. I, I think one of the um, important principles is that it's being able to do intraoperative clangiography is an integral part of doing cholecystectomy. You need to be comfortable with that technique. Now, whether you are routine or selective about it, I think uh, there's there's evidence to support both sides of that. But the important thing is that you need to be able to do it when it's indicated. And, and so it really, if you're if you're rarely, if ever, doing it then you're not going to be able to do it maybe when you need to. So I think that's, that's very important. Um, the other thing about uh, its use in prevention of bile duct injuries, so this was one of the questions that was addressed at the consensus conference. Um, and we looked extensively at the evidence on this. And the recommendation that is coming forth is that it should be used um, in situations in which there is uncertainty about the anatomy, uh, if there is concern or suspicion that a bile duct injury has occurred or in acute cholecystitis or a history of acute cholecystitis. And there's some evidence from the Galrix data that, that suggests a higher rate of injury when it's not used in those settings. So, um, so uh, that's just something I think for, uh, uh, for everyone who's watching the webinar uh, to be aware of. Let me ask the panelist about ICG. Uh, how often or when do you use it? Uh, in cholecystectomy. 
Dana, when do you use ICG? Hi, how are you? Um, so I actually switched institutions, and at the newer, at the new institution that I'm at now, we don't use it. But I used to use it um, a little bit more previously. What I found was that it was helpful in some circumstances, but I had some difficulty in using it in more in the cases, I guess, that I really wanted to use them in. So when there was like uh, stones lodged in the cystic duct or morbidly obese patients, or times when there was a lot of acute inflammation. So. It never really adopted to in every case, plus I'm, I'm more apt to do an IOC than I am to do an ICG, one for resident training, so it didn't quite fit into my practice in the same way. I, I agree. Um, this is Denise. Um, I rarely use ICG, um, and we do traditional cholangiogram if we ever need it or whenever we need it. Yeah, I um I have I have not tried it. Um, I think that um, my take on it is that the jury is still out. I, th I think that um, a lot of the you know cases that we've seen it being used, I think probably are not going to be the cases where it really is going to benefit. So um, those being the the really straightforward close cystectomies, I think that um, it doesn't prevent you know uh, the need still for a critical view of safety I think if you don't do a critical view of safety you're and you just rely on ICG I think you're taking a risk uh, so I don't think it replaces that uh, identification strategy I think the cases in which it does have um, some promise are the cases um, that we'll see later uh, dr. Brunt's case um, I think that really we need to see if it really works for acute cholecystitis in those cases where I think it's going to have a benefit. Uh, I also do routine ILC, I think, um, for, for all the reasons mentioned, especially resident education. I think that our residents really need to know how to do this. Even if they choose not to do it in practice, I think that it's our duty to teach this. Well, and the other thing about using intraoperative clangiography is uh, it's absolutely essential if you want to do one-stage management of common bile defect stones with laparoscopic common bile duct expiration. So that's the other, I think, important aspect of it. So uh, I, I use ICG selectively, usually for anticipated <coughs> cases and for you know, subsequent uh, video. I hope you can see uh, the slides, my slides on the screen. So um, I'm going to talk now about complications um, of cholecystectomy and I think the first consideration is why haven't outcomes improved more than they have? Um, patient factors, some of it may be training and experience, so that really shouldn't be the case. Uh, I think it's pretty clear there's an incomplete understanding of the critical view of safety, and uh, I'll show a little bit of evidence to that effect. Um, there's low use of and expertise with clangiography. I, sometimes there's lack of anatomic situational awareness or misperception of the anatomy. There may in some cases be flawed or inadequate technique. And I think also it relates a little bit to our overall culture of safety. And that's one of the things we're really trying to promote with uh, the SAGES program. So I'm going to cover briefly three areas of complications. I'm going to talk a little bit about access, energy, and then cholecystectomy specific. So uh, complications of laparoscopic access. Dr. Tatum, uh, Dr. Tellum has uh, talked about some of the different access approaches. And I'm going to show you data from two, uh, two different slides. There is, um, there is uh, uh, an FDA uh, report of over 1,300 laparoscopic trocar-associated injuries between um, 1997 and 2002. Uh, and there were 30 deaths. 0.1% were major vascular, 1% bowel. And it was the initial puncture in 80% of the injuries. And the pelvis was the riskiest area. There's another report from 2005. Trocars are the most common device named in malpractice injury claims associated with laparoscopic procedures. And cholecystectomy is the most pre frequent procedure associated with fatal and non-fatal trocar injuries. And uh, the ones that were reported involved shielded or optical trocars, so that doesn't necessarily prevent it. And look at the distribution of injuries in those 31 fatal cases. Ten were the aorta five iliac artery vein, vena cava, and various others, and, uh, and then bowel injuries. So 
An important principle that you heard about before, if there's previous periumbilical midline surgery, con consider an alternate access site, open ac epigastric or closed in a free quadrant, expected free quadrant of the abdomen. The other thing is I, if I'm doing closed access, I will use a varus and a 5 millimeter port and not a 1012 because if you injure something with a 5, you can likely recover from it. And sometimes the 1012s, uh, the hemorrhage is too massive uh, to recover. Inspect any attempted access site in, any, in a patient with previous abdominal surgery. And you have to be careful if you're retracting bowel uh, to do um, adhesiolysis. And you want to limit the use of electrosurgery or other energy devices. And then I think an important principle we haven't talked about postoperatively, if a patient has any untoward or unexpected course, that requires immediate attention and investigation. What about electrosurgical related injuries? SAGES has the fundamental use of surgical energy program, or FUSE. ARN is estimated 40,000 patients can be burned by faulty electrosurgical devices each year. And the problem in laparoscopic surgery is they may not be evident or detected at the time of injury. Some of you may recall this US congressman several years ago who died from a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and it was because there was an electrosurgical injury to his colon. He had a perforation sepsis and subsequently died. You should be aware that the duodenum is often either adherent to or in close proximity to the gallbladder. And so when you use energy, it should be short activations, two to three seconds, no prolonged burns. Beware of the patient who has an adhesion uh, between the duodenum and the gallbladder and that narrow attachment can lead to energy. And the other thing that I often see happen with trainees, because the activation for the energy, electrosurgical energy, is on a foot pedal. Um, they have their instruments in the abdomen, and then they can't find the pedal, and they look away while the instruments are still in. And so the instrument moves. And when you think it's safe, you could be very close to the bowel. And if you inadvertently step on the pedal, then you have a bowel injury out of sight and then the patient presents with a leak in a day or two and uh, potential sepsis. So be really very careful about that. Now, to get more specifically to the gallbladder, remember step one in the Safe Coley program is the use of the critical view of safety. So how does the classic bile duct injury occur? Well, it occurs usually when the surgeon is looking at the common bile duct but, but believes he or she is looking at the cystic duct. And so what happens is the duct is clipped, it's divided, the section continues, and then uh, another ductal structure is encountered, clipped, divided, and you have a loss of bile duct and sometimes very high level injuries. And it's also uh, not uncommon that the right hepatic artery can be injured when the common, bile, common hepatic duct is cut. So how are we doing with that? This is a, a very important study from the Netherlands. Um, it's over 1,100 consecutive lap coles. The overall bile duct injury rate was 1.7% and 0.6% were major bile duct injuries. And they reviewed 65 surgical videos of cases with complications in detail. Interestingly, the operative notes indicated the critical view was achieved in 80%, but when they looked at the video, it was achieved in only 10.8%. And importantly, the critical view was not reached in any of the patients who had a biliary injury. So this is clearly an area for improvement. Dr. Santos has uh, talked a little bit about what you do if you suspect an injury. I think the number one principle is get help, get another set of eyes. Um, if uh, the surgeon's not experienced with biliary reconstruction, we want to avoid conversion to open operation as that can make the subsequent reconstruction more difficult and you can, uh, you can extend the injury with the open operation, and uh, you certainly don't want to extend the hilum. You should leave a drain in and then transfer that patient to a center with a surgeon experienced in biliary reconstruction. So these next slides come from Module 9, uh, which is authored by Horacio Aspen and Mark Mesla, and it's on identification and management of injury, just to highlight uh, some of the principles. So. Uh, some of the reasons to suspect an injury, there's bile in the field and it's not coming from the gallbladder. You do a cholangiogram and you don't see the anatomy of the proximal or distal biliary tree. You didn't do a complete critical view of safety and then you encounter bile or an additional tubular structure in the dissection. If after you've divided the cystic duct 
a double lumen or a second lumen is seen. And those uh, are uh, stop uh, warning signs uh, for you to halt the procedure. Some of the principles are uh, you can assess the degree of injury, make sure there's no associated bleeding, and again, a conversion to open that does not protect against bile duct injuries, and it can make the subsequent reconstruction uh, more difficult. What you can do is potentially perform a cholangiogram through uh, an opening in the ductal structure. You can secure that with a, secure that with a cholangioclamp, um, and you might see leakage from the bile duct or only distal filling or only proximal filling, and that's uh, certainly an indication uh, to call for help. Now, the following principles uh, are uh, what you should do if uh, an injury has occurred, um, but I think it's important to recognize that evidence has shown that short and long-term outcomes for patients who've had a common duct injury are better when treated by hepatobiliary surgeons at high volume centers. And there is no, should be no loss of pride or anything in uh, putting a drain in a patient uh, picking up the phone and uh, calling a referral center, uh, uh, or if you have an HPB expert in your own institution, to contact them. You also need to recognize that you may need expert interventional endoscopy as well as interventional radiology uh, for this. I'll talk just briefly about uh, some of the uh, uh, strategies. Uh, if you have a, a tangential or lateral injury and no tissue loss, then that may be something that can be repaired primarily with fine absorbable suture if you have the laparoscopic skills to do that. Um, you can consider putting in a T-tube, uh, but you should not put it through the site of injury. Put it through a healthy duct, either proximal or distal to it. Place a closed suction drain and then get a cholangiogram, okay? If you have an injury that has tissue loss, in other words, a segment of the duct has been, um, been excised then um, avoid converting to open. Uh, you don't want to dissect the hilum, leave a drain, and transfer. And I think we don't emphasize enough the fact, once you've had an iatrogenic event like this, you become very emotionally involved and impacted by it. Your mind is racing, your heart is racing, you're thinking downstream, are you gonna, is there gonna be a suit? Uh, what are you, how are you gonna talk to the family? What's gonna happen to the patient? All of those things you really need to get someone independent who's not emotionally involved to come in and evaluate and assess the situation and or take care of the patient. The principles of reconstruction, uh, I will only touch on briefly, but generally if there's loss of substance, this will need to be repaired with a RUI hepatic or jejunostomy. Uh, we don't need to get into the details of how uh, that is uh, repaired or not. Um, and I think it's important uh, to recognize that some of these injuries present delayed, uh, perhaps even after the patient has been discharged from the hospital, because it could have been an outpatient procedure. And so any patient who develops abdominal pain or complains of increasing abdominal pain, fever, jaundice, nausea, vomiting, inability to take PO, if they have uh, abnormal liver function tests, they need to be evaluated immediately. Um, and they should be assessed with an ultrasound and our CT scan to look for a fluid collection and may require an ERCP uh, to uh, further uh, define the anatomy and what's going on. It's also important to have expert interventional radiology and percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography or PTC. If you've got complete occlusion on the ERCP, this is probably the best way to define the biliary anatomy at the hilum and determine the level of injury, and it also allows for biliary drainage and recover of liver function before the patient undergoes uh, definitive repair. I'll just remind everybody of uh, classification. There are different classifications of biliary injury. This is the Strasburg Strasburg classification. A, B, C, D are all uh, relatively minor injuries. Um, e injuries are those with loss of substance and can be quite uh, severe, uh, even with uh, beyond the confluence of the ducts. I should say a word about cystic duct stump leaks. Uh, they are not necessarily benign. This is a series from a few years ago of 12 patients. Um, they presented a mean of 2.3 days post-op. Five had so-called abnormal cystic ducts. Most presented with abdominal pain. Most could be presented, could be treated by ERCP and stenting. Uh, but there was one patient who died in this series. 
Um, these patients may require percutaneous drainage to decompress a large biloma. Uh, most can be treated with an ERCP sphincterotomy and stent placement that needs to be in place for a few weeks. There may be a HIDA scan helpful in uh, some cases for evaluating these. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's really important to take uh, proper steps to secure the cystic duct. If you've got a thickened cystic duct, um, because of a lot of inflammation, you may want to put a pre-tied loop suture around it to secure it so you don't have a leak from uh, a clip. Um, and then this is just an image of a high transsectional bile duct injury. And I would just point out, look at all the clips that are present there. So it obviously tells you that there was something going on at operation in that that should have been a tip-off uh, that uh, something wasn't right uh, with the anatomy. Uh, biolomas can be associated with major or minor uh, duct injuries, and uh, some minor ones can be treated by stenting, and you probably need to percutaneously drain the biloma. Okay. And then finally, I'll just touch on brief, briefly on bleeding, uh, which can be from uh, any of these vessels that are shown here. <coughs> if you have major bleeding, you should try to tamponade it um, and, uh, and may need to get help or open. If it's minor bleeding, uh, tamponade it briefly and then go work somewhere else for a while and hopefully it will stop. So um, uh, indications for open are if you can't define the anatomy, you can't control it, or massive hem hemorrhage that can't be immediately controlled. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show another uh, video now. Uh, and this is, uh, should be a relatively uh, routine laparoscopic cholecystectomy. You can see the bile duct uh, to the right. Uh, there's the cystic artery being clipped, and the cystic duct uh, is uh, going to be clipped and divided. Uh, again, I would say there's no critical view. They haven't taken the lower well, part of the gallbladder off the liver bed and dissected that. So the uh, cystic duct is divided, and then the surgeon proceeds with uh, electrosurgery dissection and then encounters uh, some major hemorrhage and uh, makes an effort to control that further with electrosurgery, and that uh, is not going to work in this case. So uh, the uh, uh, injury is uh, tamponaded in grass to get uh, temporary control. And uh, you can see that there is no perfusion to the right lobe of the liver. So this is a right hepatic artery injury. Um, and the hepatic artery can come very close to the gallbladder, like you heard in Dr. G's talk, and you have to be very aware and cognizant of that. Uh, in this particular case, uh, there was an advanced surgeon who was able to uh, repair this uh, laparoscopically. Um, now, liver parenchymal bleeding, um, you can get significant hemorrhage from the liver if you get into the liver bed. That's why it's important to maintain that plane of dissection. You can use higher energy if you get some bleeding from the parenchyma, uh, even topical hemostatic agents. And I'll just show a short video of this. So surgeon's dissecting the gallbladder off, and uh, it's doing it rather quickly and gets a little too deep, and you get a hepatic vein injury in the liver bed. Uh, this is something that will not be controllable with electrosurgery. And uh, in this particular case, this was tamponaded and then had to be controlled with a direct suture, which was done laparoscopically. So just to summarize, um, bile duct injury prevention is the best strategy. Um, it's important to recognize it early to drain and get the patient to the appropriate uh, uh, center with expertise to take care of this. And uh, the principles of cystic duct stump leak and intraoperative bleeding uh, we have uh, talked about. I would just, uh, again, encourage you to take some time and go through these modules. You've heard quite a bit from them already this evening, but uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think, very valuable information in here that will help you be safer in your surgical practice and hopefully uh, not only embrace yourself, but to encourage your colleagues and uh, educate those in your institution locally. Fernando, do you want to just stop for just a moment? And, uh, sure. Are there sure. any questions so one of the talk about here before we show, uh, maybe show a video? Yeah, so one of the questions looks like, um, if you, I'll paraphrase, so if you have a, um, an injury, uh, how many drains do you use? Where do you place them? Um, what do you think, Dr. Bruns? Well, you need to put in enough drains to provide adequate drainage, okay? And um, 
probably in most uh, situations one drain will be adequate, adequate if it's well placed. It should be placed uh, underneath the liver in Morrison's pouch. Make sure you have enough drain uh, that's <coughs> in the abdomen and, um, and then uh, secure it because you're going to have the patient uh, hopefully transferred uh, that day uh, or the next day at the absolute latest and get them to a center with expertise where they can get additional evaluation and begin uh, treatment for this. Yeah, I think um, the other thing to keep in mind is some people have asked previously, um, what if the gallbladder is still in? What do I do about that? You know, what if there's sort of a, already a hole in the gallbladder? And I think, again, um, that's kind of a minor point. It, you know, in that situation, if you need to, just put a drain next to or into the gallbladder and get out, no harm. Um, let the, the other surgeon deal with that. I think that'll be less risky than trying to complete the cholecystectomy at that point with a more dangerous situation. I, I would uh, I would echo that. Uh, leave the gallbladder in. Now, uh, what you don't want is to have a big hole in the gallbladder and be spilling uh, stones all over the abdomen. So, if you have a, goal, a hole in the gallbladder, you can uh, you can put an in the loop around it, or you can suture it, or close it off somehow. Um, and that would be the only caveat. I wouldn't. <coughs> I wouldn't uh, stones being spilled out from the gallbladder, but it's probably best to just leave the gallbladder in situ. Yeah. One of the questions um, is, has anybody seen or heard of a CO2 embolus during dissection of the gallbladder off the liver bed? I, I have not, although I have heard of people having problems from embolus um, when an argon um, beam coagulator was used, and this is usually because folks forget to vent uh, during the use of that instrument, so that is a, a risk with that instrument. Um, I haven't seen it from that, but you could imagine that there's probably some injury to that middle hepatic vein if that were to happen. and. I think that just speaks to the importance of making sure that you're really staying on the gallbladder when you're dissecting it off um, the back of the liver, and if you and you're doing one of these uh, subtotal colostomies. Yeah, Dr. Kelly, you're muted. It'll go in the liver and, and create that problem. Okay, so um, looks like one of the other questions is, um, and I'll paraphrase, um, have you ever had a case where you did a subtotal cholecystectomy and then came back for a, a completion cholecystectomy is the way I, I interpret that question. And um, I, I have not done my own, but I have definitely operated on um, remnant gallbladders. They can be quite challenging. I think one of the things, if you're going to do that, is to wait, um, you know, a good six months if you can, if you can afford to, to let the inflammation subside. I think um, sometimes people talk about cooling gallbladders off and going back six to eight weeks later. I don't think that's enough time. I, I think that, that you're going to face still very difficult operative conditions. If you can wait several months, I think it's much better. I totally agree. I mean, I think patience is a virtue in these cases, um, and I have I have not um, purposefully performed a subtotal cholecystectomy and then plan to go back for a second look. Oftentimes, we um, have patients referred in who were supposed to have a complete cholecystectomy and ended up with a remnant. Uh, so that's why it's important to follow a lot of those um, tips and tricks, uh, Dr. Santos, that you actually stated in your talk. Yeah, I think the point is for if you if you can do a fenestrating subtotal, that really is your destination therapy. You, you really don't want to have to go back. And uh, most often if you do a fenestrating, you shouldn't need to go back, uh, as opposed to if you do the reconstituting. Those are typically most often the ones you, you, you do end up finding and uh, having to do a completion colostectomy. I have a question for Dr. G. Um, so 
let's say a patient comes in and they've had uh, symptoms for a week, 10 days. Um, let's say you have a palpable gallbladder, um, you know, why kind of 18,000? Uh, what are your thoughts on, on really what to do with those patients where you know it's going to be really not easy? Yeah, I mean, as you stated earlier, oftentimes the concept of cooling them off and bringing them back, it sounds good. <clears throat> uh, but usually by the time you adequately try to cool them off, patients don't, they end up with a recurrence of their symptoms or whatnot. And so I've actually, um, if they're still, you know, within the first week or so and, um, and they, they're very symptomatic, I often will take them uh, to the operating room and just be prepared for a difficult um, gallbladder. Uh, I have found that I do think this critical view of safety is huge. And so even in the most difficult gallbladders, if you stick to the same principle, and I do the same operation, no matter if it's, a, if it's a difficult gallbladder or a straightforward gallbladder, if you always follow the same principles, it's much um, safer and um, harder to get into trouble. So I do try yeah. to do them early on. Um, I think the problem is when you don't have a great story and the patient, you know, says they've, you know, had symptoms and you're trying to tease out exactly how long the symptoms have been going on for, but during the acute period, if I'm able to take them to the OR, I do. Yeah, I think for me the key has been um, with the critical view of safety, recognizing when it's just not going to happen. And I used to spend a lot more time trying to get it, trying to get it, you know, chiseling through stuff. And I think now, I mean, really within five minutes, you can usually tell if it's going to happen or not. And if it's not, then you just do a subtotal colostectomy. Agree. I think we uh, do have to be careful that we don't let the pendulum swing too far to doing subtotals because we don't have a lot of good long-term data on those. And I think if you do a subtotal, the devil's in the details of how you do it. You don't want to leave too much of a remnant, and you want to make sure that you get all of the stones out of that gallbladder and not reconstitute it, do a fenestrating type approach. But I don't think we want to do subtotal colostectomy every time it gets a little bit difficult. You have to understand what your limitations are and and be safe and stay on the gallbladder the whole time. Okay, would you like to do your video, uh, Mike? Sure. Sorry, I'm technologically challenged here. So um, this is a 43-year-old man who uh, 18 months before had a laparoscopic converted to open subtotal cholecystectomy. And about five months previously, he began developing recurrent symptoms of biliary colic. His BMI was 42. Uh, he had an obese abdomen and a large right subcostal surgical scar. Here's a CT scan where you can see his remnant gallbladder and multiple stones that are present uh, within it. So um, we elected to do this uh, laparoscopically, and we used uh, ICG. Uh, access was a bit of an issue, so we got initial access in the left upper quadrant with a closed technique, then got a second uh, port in, and then began ticking down adhesions to his right subcostal area and liver with a combination of sharp and blunt dissection. Fortunately, most of these we were able to uh, sweep down uh, pretty easily. So at this point in time, we just uh, have a couple of uh, ports in place, one for the camera and one uh, for the scissors. Then we're able to get uh, a second port in uh, laterally, and then we continue to take adhesions down and then and get our uh, final get our fourth uh, port in. So uh, now we're working uh, up towards the liver and taking uh, adhesions down from underneath uh, the liver. And here you be can begin to see this uh, remnant uh, gallbladder that uh, comes into view. We switch to uh, infrared clangiography. Here you can see the background of the liver. And there is actually the bile duct. Okay. And uh, we also used intraoperative ultrasound to verify that we were looking at the remnant gallbladder uh, with stones in it. 
So we began uh, dissecting uh, along this uh, rimlet gallbladder. The duodenum is down at the bottom of the screen here. And um, so we're just uh, taking down adhesions uh, from around the gallbladder. We switched back and forth to ICG. Here's the, here's the bile duct. The duodenum is right here. And then here is the remnant gallbladder. And in this case, there was a right hepatic artery crossing anteriorly as well. So uh, we did a combination of uh, a blunt dissection. Again, here is the bile duct. And uh, you don't see any uh, fluorescence in the remnant gallbladder or the cystic duct. And that's because there's an impacted stone. So um, now we go a little bit higher up, and we're taking some of this gallbladder off. We've gotten a window around the uh, cystic duct, but not completely dissected that out. So we went uh, further up and dissected this with the uh, uh, monopolar. And um, as we proceed, we actually get into the gallbladder with some semi-purulent uh, thin fluid. Uh, so we continue to dissect this off uh, the gallbladder bed. There's a, a small uh, stone that's present there. Uh, kind of get back into the right plane a bit, um, and then continue uh, releasing this uh, from the liver. And now, as you can see, we have a, have a window around this uh, distal uh, cystic duct. There you can see the cystic artery. And uh, the gallbladder is off the bed, so we have the critical view. You can see the cystic duct lymph node there. And then we switch back to the IC, ICG. Again, there's no fluorescence in the uh, cystic duct. You can see the bile duct down below, cystic artery, cystic duct, and then the remnant gallbladder above. So <clears throat> we then clipped the artery and divided it. And uh, <clears throat> see the lumen of the cystic artery there. And then, uh, again, ICG once again. So one of the advantages you can uh, map frequently uh, during the operation. We elected to do a cholangiogram in this patient. You can see uh, bile duct uh, here, and it looks like there's some stones in the cystic duct still, and possibly something even more distally. So um, there was an impacted stone that we could palpate in the lower part of the cystic duct. So we had to extend that incision uh, somewhat to try to get that out. And then, um, and then we're able to milk this uh, stone up and out of the uh, lower part of the thickened cystic duct there. Now you can see some more uh, stone debris that's coming out of the cystic duct stump, which we removed with a uh, stone forceps. Got all this out, and then um, we switched back to the infrared, and you can now see that there's fluorescence in the cystic duct stump, as well as the bile duct, which wasn't there before. So I felt in this case this was particularly helpful. Uh, because of concern about a stone in the bile duct, we did transcystic cholidocoscopy. You can see a distal stone there that we were able to basket and, um, and remove. And the second stone that was there, we were able to push into the duodenum using the cholidocoscope. And then we secured the cystic duct stump with an end loop and then uh, divided the remnant gallbladder after that um, and uh, removed it. And we did over sew the uh, stump of this uh, with a suture. So with that, I will uh, stop the video and uh, take any comments or questions from the, uh, from the, from the audience. From, uh, I actually from the have, a, I have a and, question. Yeah. Um, do you ever, uh, I used it, you used an endo loop, um, but that was a pretty um, big structure. Do you ever uh, use a stapler across that? I I do not uh, because I think if if you're if it's thick enough that you have to use a stapler, then you probably should take a little bit more off and get a little bit further down. And if I'm gonna if I'm leaving that much, then I would leave it open as a fenestrated subtotal cholecystectomy. But if it's a cystic duct then I would secure it uh, with a loop suture. 
So I've never used a stapler. I know surgeons do that, but I, my concern is that you recon, reconstitute a mini gallbladder distally when you do that. And uh, a, a pre-tied loop suture is much less expensive than a stapler also. True. So Mike, I think that was a great video. I think it, um, those are the kind of cases I think that are the most high yield for the ICG technology, um, really where, you know, you need all those adjuncts to be able to guide you for those difficult cases. So very nice video. So typically I, I use a Cine angiography mode when I'm getting a diagnostic quality images. Otherwise we'll use a spot. It's important to have the radiologist do, uh, I'm sorry, the anesthesiologist do apnea so you can get good images. This is just a little animation showing uh, the typical C-arm setup. And in this case, um, you can see the biliary trees over the spine. And so one of the adjustments you can make to fix that is you actually put the C-arm in what's called LAO, left anterior oblique uh, mode. And as you can see, that moves the biliary tree off the spine so you can get a little better uh, visualization. These are some um, tips and tricks which I will not um, go into right now. Um, but I will say that for the sake of time, you can find all of these uh, slides and demonstrations um, in the iBook that I helped uh, author with Dr. Rosser, uh, Dr. Butch Rosser. This is available free for download for iTunes and includes a section on Flanjar if you, if you care to look at it in more detail. So this is the case that I wanted to just show. This is what I'll call a near miss. And this is a elective uh, close stectomy patient with prior um, history of, of uh, symptomatic stones, but no acute close cystitis. So we just begin by lysing adhesions. And then typically we'll incise the peritoneum on the medial uh, and lateral sides. So here we're just taking these very superficial uh, peritoneal attachments. I, I like to do this because it opens the, the gallbladder uh, hepatocystic triangle up widely before you go deep. So here we're just moving along on the medial side. Then we'll switch over to the lateral side. And you just march along. You don't really need to go deep. You just want to release some of those uh, tissues. Then we go back to the medial side, and we're going to work on slightly deeper uh, level, just, again, very methodically taking small bites. That's why I like the hook, because you can actually see all of your bites. There you can see the medial edge of that cystic duct and the lateral edge that we're working on. You can see we have a small window there that we're going to make uh, larger. We're again working towards the uh, where the artery is going to be usually, just taking the small bits of tissue. And this is actually the uh, resident uh, working with me, very good uh, resident. And we'll start to uh, push down a little bit. And what you notice here is boom, all of a sudden there's a big fat ductal structure right there which had not become visible until that move. So now we can, we can see how near this um, big duct was to the gallbladder. And here, again, it's, it's visible right here at the base. So now we're a little bit more worried. This, this is uh, the resonance still going. This is actually me switching over to the other side of the table because I got nervous. <laughs> And then we're going to just do a little blunt dissection with the sucker, try to see how the tissues move. I kind of like moving the gallbladder, seeing how that ductal structure moves in relation to it. Just do a little blunt dissection here, just very carefully trying to make a little more space between that duct. And you can see just with a little blunt dissection, we can get a little more separation there. Working towards our critical view of safety getting that cystic plate cleared off. 
Again, just taking small bites of stuff that we can see. Fernando, I, I, um, I tend to, I start uh, the dissection with uh, electrosurgical monopolar also and do a lot of the section that way. But then once I kind of get that leaflet open a bit, I'll get a Maryland dissector and do some blunt dissecting in there. So um, mm -hmm. do you use uh, that very much? And I don't know if that would have helped you in this case, but now you've got a nice window there. But it just kind of helps open up those planes a little bit uh, and limits the use of energy right down near the ductal structures. Yeah, so I think this case illustrates how even in a case where there was not a lot of inflammation, not a lot of fibrosis, this big ductal structure can, can essentially be kissing the gallbladder. You just got to be aware of that, that it could always be lurking and, and uh, just under the surface. Okay, that's all I have. I so that's, that's a really good time. illustration. So I, I, think, uh, I think we're out of time, but um, this, is, uh, this has been a great session. There's been a lot of engagement by the audience. We very much appreciate your participation. and. Thanks to Dr. Santos, Dr. G, Dr. Tell Tellum uh, for, uh, for your presentations and uh, engagement and discussion on this. And uh, um, all we'd just like to say is to uh, become uh, proponents of uh, safe cholecystectomy principles at your institution. We'd be happy to take any follow-up questions uh, from any of you and uh, be safe out there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.